So, welcome back. Now, we are moving to the second uh, session of uh, module 1 and here basically we are going to discuss that what are the various challenges which HRD professionals are facing. Now, in the first module probably we try to explain you that why HRD is important, what is HRD. Now, since these HRD activities are taken by HRD professionals, we have to see that how these HRD professionals are going to carry out the activities related to human resource development. right? So, we are moving to this direction. Now, what are the challenges which our HRD professionals are facing today? Okay. See, the workforce is not very heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, sorry homogeneous, it is going to be very, very homogeneous. Okay. So, you will find that the demographic of the workforce has changed, it is much more cosmopolitan or what you call heterogeneous in nature. Why I am telling you that if you go to any workplace today, in any part of the India, you will find that people from all walks of life okay, working together. They may, they may, there may be people from different regions, different cultures, different age groups okay. and the needs, expectations and development requirements of this uh, workforce is different and this creates a major challenge for meeting the requirements, development requirements especially of a workforce which is very, very diverse in nature. Another important activity is that yes, because of the globalization, it has created lot of required demand. Third, we will discuss them all these points separately. So, the third point is that how we are going to eliminate the skill gap, because one of the major advantages of offering an HRD pro, uh, program or any kind of HRD intervention by the professionals is to ensure that there is no mismatch in the knowledge and skill gap and you are industry ready or you are ready for the job that you are going to perform. Okay. And then the fourth point is that yes, HRD is not concerned or it is not a one time affair, okay, but it is a continuous learning process which you have which has to be carried out on a regular basis, because you need to update your knowledge and skill base on a regular basis. And finally, from individual learning we are moving to organizational learning. So, we will take up all these points one by one together and that is what we are going to discuss here. Now, if you look at the first point changing workforce demographics, this data actually uh, shows a trend at the global level. Now, if you look at this data, it suggests that how Asians are going to increase in the total workforce from 4 to 6 work percent, but it might go further up to 10 percent, because if you look at the Asian population okay, and the people who are working especially from say India and China, their percentage is much more higher than in any, any other country if you go to any advanced or developed countries. Okay. Now, so the role of Asians are going to be increased, uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, a, say in many IT companies not only in India, but abroad okay, you will find 30 to 40 percent people working they and they belong from either India or China or other Asian countries. Similarly, you will find that the role of whites actually is going down. Okay. This is a uh, this is not this may not be a very good trend and that is why you will find that recently some of the developed countries are trying to prevent people from these countries to take up jobs in their countries and that and so that this trend can be reversed. Now, if you look at the women participation in the workforce which is also going to increase. So, half of the entire workforce is going to be the women in the workforce. Similarly, if you look at older workforce those who are above 55 plus are going to increase in okay, and they are going to say form at least 25 percent of the total workforce which is a huge workforce. Now, in some Asian countries uh, you will find certain disturbing trends not in India, in India we have a major chunk of workforce which belong to say 20 to 35 or 40. But in certain Asian countries you will find that this trend is definitely uh, different say for Japan. Japan has a huge older population okay, because of the longevity of the life and other factors. Okay. So, these are certain trends which are changing the demography or the, the composition of the workforce not only in India, but different countries. Now, if you look at specifically the India case of India, you, there are certain trends that is expected. Now, we are having jobless growth. Okay. What does it mean? It means 
what we call demographic bonus or demographic dividend that is much talked about. Okay. If you look at the data it shows suggests that 1000 million people are going to be of working age population by 2030 that is another 10 to 12 years. So, is it possible to provide employment to so many people? Are these people have the requisite knowledge and skill base at a macro level to take up jobs? Whether the government or other sectors would be able to create employment for so many people. So, these are some of the issues related to the Indian population. It means that India need to generate another 280 million jobs in the end of the 30 years, especially for the working population that is 15 to 64. Maybe all kind of sector organized, organized, informal, formal, including all kind of sectors. Okay. Even if you look at unorganized sector which is growing heavily and it is going to say up to 93 percent population by 2017. These databases are very, very important because that helps you to understand that what kind of development activities that need to be taken not what you call at the micro level, the individual level, but at the societal level, the national level and what kind of HRD interventions can be planned. So, that we do not have a case of unemployability okay. and at the same time we are able to provide job as per their knowledge and the skill base. So, if you look at the growth of the companies, companies are growing at the rate of 2 percent which is lowest in the 5 years means the growth of the organizations have gone down. So, this would create another situation where you will find that it is moving to what you call jobless growth. So, this is the data that is provided uh, by that how India is looming uh, towards a what you call a demographic disaster. Now, look at the next point competing in the global economy. See after the liberalization process things have changed and it is almost what you call 25 years since the globalization, globalization process started in India. The most important thing that is happening is in the field of technology, advances in technology. Whether you are able to match the requirement in the case of technology or not. Now, if you look at technological advancements or the life cycle of a product, which is changing very fast. So, how to cope up with this changes that is happening in the field of technology, so that you can compete globally. And that is where HRT has a role. So, to ensure that you have the requisite knowledge and skill base to develop those technologies to match the requirements. Okay. And that is where you need more skilled and educated people to take up the challenges in a global economy. Okay. Similarly, another important point that probably we are missing in, in the global economy and what you call the globalization is cultural sensitivity. Okay. That is where we are want to discuss about the role of say national culture or other things because that is going to affect the way people work, okay. the kind of mindset the people have, how they view the work, how they view the life. Okay. For example, you will find that even uh, people working more than say 60 hours, 70 hours per week are not that productive compared to people who are working say 30 hours, 35 hours. Recently, I look at the data where say that in western countries people are working for 37 hours working, uh, per week are more productive than that people in India who are working for 48 hours, 50 hours. Okay. So, there are certain issues related to the culture which is going to affect your attitude and behavior the way we work. Okay. So, you also need to be sensitive about the cultural context of the work and because it is going to affect your attitude and behavior. Sen See, most of the organizations are moving from individual to team working now. So, another this has created another challenge for HR professionals to train them to work as a team, and that is a huge challenge for the people because in India probably we are not used the app to do these kind of things. Similarly, you also need to develop certain new skills like problem solving, communication, good relationship, interpersonal skills. These are some of the skills which would be required for you to compete 
in a global environment, not just technical skills, okay, including cross cultural skills probably from suppose you are um, going for assignments elsewhere. So, you need to develop these kind of skills, you have to be culturally sensitive, you need to work in a team, you need to develop these communication interpersonal skills, so that you can compete effectively. So, one of the major problem that India is going to face is related to eliminating the skill gap, because if you are not able to eliminate the skill gap, the question of employability remains valid. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, skill gap issues, the data says that 15 million youngsters entering the workforce each year, at least 75 percent are not, not job ready in India. It means, the rate of employability for the new graduates or those who are going to enter into the workforce is at the rate of 25 percent people. What to do with uh, other 75 percent people? The government of India has taken certain steps to eliminate these skill gaps like NSDC, finished school concept and there is other things that are coming up, where they are trying to train you, so that you develop the required, required knowledge and skill base to take up jobs. Okay. Similarly, you will also find that there has been shift from, uh, shift in the employment that it is not only going to be qualification based, but it has to be skill based. It means, if you have got a degree for a B tech or M tech or MA, MSc, it will not fetch you a job, but what you need is basically, you need certain requisite set of skills, which you are, which is going to make you employable. Okay. So, the idea is not to give only the theoretical basis or the knowledge only, but you also impart certain skills which make you employable and that is where the role of institutionals especially educational institutions become very, very important. So, they have to see that you develop those skills which make you ready for jobs in the industry or any kind of organization, is not it. And that is where we talk about better industry college interface, so that industry tells about its requirements, colleges know what is the kind of knowledge and skill base that would be required by the industry. And they are able to design the curriculum and other kind of things, so that you become ready for the job. Okay. The entire ministry of human resource development, you know that they are trying to do this kind of exercise by going for this NSDC, finish schools are offering a lot of programs. Even these online programs which are being offered for not only in my course, but other courses are basically an example of increasing your knowledge and skill base related to a particular field, so that you can work effectively. So, <coughs> you what basically the important is that if you want to really eliminate the skill gap, you need to develop certain skills, okay. basic skills, soft technical skills and soft and behavioral skills. Okay. And it is very important for you to develop these skills, otherwise you may not remain viable in the long run. Now, I am just going to present you a very important fact related to skill gap report, which is uh, published by WEST and they have shown that if you look at the skill gap report, you can really say how India is fared so far as eliminating the skill gap and what is happening to this. Now, the data from the three years sho is showing the rate of employability okay, for different kind of professions. It starts with say arts, BCom, BSc, MSc, ITI, Polytechnics, okay, engineers or MBAs. Now, if you look at this, you will find that in some cases, uh, there is not much improvement. In fact, in some cases, you will find that employability has gone down, is not it, from 2014 to 2016. It means that we have not been able to work much so far as eliminating the skill gap is concerned. What is, the, if you look at this graph on employability, if you look say for arts graduate it has gone up, but if you look at engineers it is going down over the years from 14 to 15, 15 to 16. Okay. In some cases uh, it has not gone much down, but you will find that there is no change in the level of employability. Okay. So, now, moving to another data, if you look at gender wise employability. Okay. Now, if you look at this data, what does this suggest? So, especially about males and females. So, on the left side, you have data related to the male, and if you look at data on the right side, is it is related to the female. If you look at this data from 2014 to 2016, you will find that yes, the rate of employability, whether it is male or female, there is no significant difference. It is more or less same. It's 
the only thing is that in case of female there is slight increase you will find in their employability level right. Now, the question is that what kind of skills are required by the employees in order to remain viable. So, if you look at this graph the next one you can see these are some of the skills that is required by the employees and this is the data based on a survey which was conducted conducted in 2017 uh, from most of the industries. So, see if you look at some of the skills like see domain expertise the most important thing. Next impo most important thing you will find is whether you are really able to learn your learning agility then you have integrity and values that is more important ok. Uh, then your mathematical ability, your cultural sensitivity, sens adaptability, your communication skills, your adaptability ok. So, it is not only your domain expertise which is only important at the rate of 20 percent, but the other skill sets which is required by you to bridge the gap in your knowledge and skill base. And if you do not have those skills like say result orientation, then what will happen? Probably you will not remain employable or you may not get an employment. So, if you look at this data you can see that some of the skills that is required is more related to what you call soft skills or behavioral skills like your interpersonal communications, your cultural adaptability, your result orientation, uh, your ability to learn new things that is more important in today's context. Otherwise, you, it may not be possible for you to re, uh, your say eliminate your skill gap and you may not remain employable all the time. Now, so the most important thing is that if you really want to increase your knowledge and skill, skill base. It is not a one time affair, but you have to see that you go for continuous learning, regular updating of your learning activities. So, it is a continuous process. Why? Because lot of changes are happening in the environment, okay. especially in the organizations. You know structures, processes, technology everything is changing. So, if everything is changing, if you do not learn about these changes and if you do not adapt about these changes that is happening in the organization probably you may not remain viable. So, it is very very important for you to learn about the changes that is happening in different fields whether it is related to organization, technology, products, processes. Okay. So, these are the changes that is happening. What kind of changes is happening in the structure? Say organization is going for restructuring. So, maybe your roles and responsibilities for change. See most of the organizations are in order to remain viable are going for a lot of restructuring, redesigning, relayering, all kind of exercises. Okay. So, what will happen in that case your roles and responsibilities change. Say for example, in one organization they club three levels of people in one organization and they made they said that they are going to be called head of the departments, senior general managers, uh, uh, assistant general managers and general managers. They have been clubbed together in one uh, designation that is called head of the departments. Okay. Now, with these kind of restructuring there is going to be change in the roles and responsibilities of the people. So, you need to learn that what are the activities which is going to help you to perform effectively okay. and whether you have the requisite knowledge and skill base to work effectively in a new role. right? Similarly, if you look at the technology, if you look at technology, technology is which is defined as the nature of production system it is changing. Okay. Now, with the changing nature of technology what will happen moving from say traditional manu uh, manual technology or moving to sorry computer based technology, computer integrated technology or computer integrated manufacturing what you call flexible manufacturing systems or we are going to have automation or robotics or what you call uh, the new things that is coming up in through the picture like art artificial intelligence or machine learning. Okay. Where the most of the jobs are going to be automated or would be done by the robots or the machine. Okay. So, you need to if you do not update yourself you may not re remain viable or you become obsolete because if a machine learning or say artificial intelligence comes, in, comes into the picture what will happen to your job. So, you need to learn new things in order to remain employable in the market and the changes in the technology basically forces you to uh, either adapt to it or go for it or learn new things so that you can work with the new technology then products. If you look at the product life cycle it is also changing. So, you need to ensure that you are going to offer products which are going to be innovative okay, which will have a market 
okay, which is going to be more creative, it have better features than your competitors, but how it is possible? Unless you have the capacity to be innovative and creative yourselves and that is where say kind of intervention that can be planned like offering a program on creativity and innovations okay, for R&D managers, so that they come out with the new products, new processes both, okay, so that you remain viable in the long run as a organization and both as a individual, because if you look at products and processes they are changing very fast, look at the product life cycle. Okay. In for example, in mobile communication the product life cycle is 4 months now, 6 to 4 months. It means in a span of 4 to 6 months another feature is added to the product. So, if you are not going to be competitive enough, if you are not having the knowledge and skill base to add a competitive product probably will not be, uh, will not remain viable in the market. So, you need to face these challenges as a charity profession to ensure that your employees or your human resources develop those competencies to ensure that the products and processes are competitive. Okay. You, we are adapting, adapting certain processes, but they may no longer be required by you. So, you would go for restructuring of these processes. What I am talking about is business process, uh, business processes. So, you need to go for re-engineering of business processes to delete those processes which are no longer viable, which are no longer effective and opt for a different kind of process. So, that you are able to increase efficiency, improve quality, improve your productivity. Otherwise, your business processes may not help you to remain competitive. Sim so, if you are going for this kind of changes, who is going to do it? It is the people who are going to be responsible for this. And if people do not change and if they do not adapt to the changes probably nothing is going to happen. Because any kind of change which is coming in the field of say organization, technology, products or processes, who is responsible? It is the responsibility of the people. And the people if they do not have the knowledge and skill base, then probably they will not be able to compete. So, what is the role of HRD professionals? To ensure that their employees are able to adapt to the changes that is happening and for that whatever is required, whatever intervention is required in terms of training them or mentoring them or ensuring their growth and development. So, that they have those skills or competencies which will help you, uh, which will help these employees to ensure that they are able to compete in terms of technology, products and processes, so that they remain competitive and that is where the need for continuous learning comes into the picture. Uh, that is why HRD professionals have to ensure that they need to design and intervene on a regular basis to upgrade the knowledge and skill base of their people. Now, the next point is organizational learning. Now, we are moving from individual learning to organizational learning. What does it mean? It means that organization should be able to learn adopt and uh, adopt and change to remain competitive, but how it is possible unless individuals are competent enough. So, we are moving from individual learning to organization learning. Now, when, when we are moving from individual learning to organization learning, it means that in there are certain processes which you call at the organization level which is being carried out by the people. So, from individual learning to organization learning, we need to ensure that how individual learning is going to contribute to the growth and development of the organization. Okay. Because with individual learning probably organizations are going to learn, adapt to these changes and also change their products, processes, technology regularly, so that they remain competitive. Otherwise, organizations are not going to remain competitive and they will be lagging behind. Now, if you look at uh, some of the principles that have been suggested by Peter Sange uh, in his book Learning Organization, he suggested certain uh, principles, these are five principles which have been suggested uh, by uh, Peter Sange to become a learning organization. Now, uh, we also need to make a difference here between organizational learning and learning organization. So, organizational learning is a process through which you become a learning organization. So, learning organization is an intermediate outcome, not a final outcome, because today if you look are a learning organization, it means that you are doing well, you are able to adapt and change yourself remain competitive, not necessarily that tomorrow again you are going to remain competitive. 
So, you need to continuously adapt and change yourself on a regular basis as an organization and that is where you remain competitive. So, the idea is that through certain processes you are able to learn as an organization not as an individual to see that you are going to change and adapt quickly to the competitors you remain viable. Here I am going to give one example, two different examples say for example, take HMT watch and say Titan both have though at different point times of point they have been doing well, but HMT has not been able to learn and adapt and change themselves with the requirements while Titan has gone for diversification they adopted the strategies they have been able to learn and change themselves on a continuous basis. So, who is going to be more competitive definitely Titan not HMT or you look at automobile sector you know that there is a lot of competition in the auto automobile sector. I know the oldest some of the oldest companies which are there in India like Fiat or say Hindustan Motors no longer exist today because they have not been able to adapt and change themselves to remain competitive. So, the idea is that as a organization if you not do not learn adapt and change you may not remain competitive, but how this organizational learning takes place it takes place through individuals because as an individual if you do not learn and contribute to changes in the product process and technology organizations are not going to be viable. Okay. So, if through these processes you are going to become a learning organization and some of the principles that is discussed here like systems thinking it means that you have to think from the holistic perspective not just one thing. So, you have to think about the organization as the entire system as a whole system and you need to look at the entire system not just one part of the organization and see that how you can integrate the activities of the entire organization into one and should be able to see the big picture. First, second is personal mastery that is related to competence the knowledge and skill base of the people. The third one is the mental models, mental models basically talks about the knowledge sorry the attitude and the mindset of the people. Okay. So, if you have the, uh, the kind of mindset or attitude that there is no point going for a change and it is not going to help you probably you will not be able to grow and development. If you do not take risks say for example, then what will happen? So, you need to change your mindset in order to compete. The next one is say shared vision, shared vision means what? It means that everyone in the organization be it individuals, be it groups or be it departments has to share the same vision okay, through their act through their activities. So, that all of them integrate their activities, coordinate their activities and able to contribute to the goals and objectives of the organization. And finally, this is possible with team learning where everybody work together coordinate their activities or integrate their activities, so that they are able to contribute to the growth of the organization. Thank you very much.